want to talk about today is how we're going to be doing vocab throughout the, the year. Uh, we'll follow the same format, so it's going to be kind of important, um, since this will be part of your grade, that we um, get the, the format and the particulars of it correct. Uh, I'm a firm believer that vocab is very important. Vocab, any particular curriculum, has its own um, set of words that are related to it. And for us to better understand the content of that curricular area, we, we need to also understand the words that are associated with it. And so from that standpoint, uh, vocab can be very important. As we do our vocab, um, every unit will start out with giving you a list of words, and then we'll give you some time to work on those words. And so what you'll do is you'll write the words down, and uh, you're going to need some 3 by 5 cards. We've already talked about that, so you know the requirements on it. And uh, we'll take and we'll write each word down on your vocab card. Now I'm going to kind of refer to the front of the card as the side of the card that does not have the lines, okay? Because uh, we'll start off here, and we'll use our first word. And our first word that we're going to do is prehistory. So I'll just go ahead and start writing this out here. Okay, and I kind of suggest that you start at the top. I I'm going to have you draw pictures that kind of help represent the definition to kind of help you better understand some of the terms. Uh, I won't have you do it all the time because I do understand it's a little time intensive, but I think it's important that we understand that if we have a hard time grasping definitions, that if we can kind of create a visual representation of it, sometimes that can kind of help solidify um, the meanings of those terms in our mind. So our first term here is prehistory. Some of the words that we're going to come in contact with throughout the year, you may already have some understanding of. Uh, you may have a partial understanding of it, but what we want to do is to get a complete understanding of that term. So prehistory, you may or may not know at this point in time what prehistory is, uh, but that's kind of what me as your resources, I give you some information throughout the unit will be used for, but also your textbook will be a great resource to get some information as well. Um, I do strongly suggest that you use the textbook. Uh, don't get your definitions off of the internet, as definitions off the internet have a tendency to be very general in nature and not specifically apply to the content of our particular unit, because sometimes words and their definitions can change depending upon how you're, they're used. And I'm just going to slide this over here and our next one is going to be artifact. Okay, now you probably may have these words already in front of you, uh, but we'll just have two here that we'll kind of use as our uh, kind of guinea pig experiments here. Okay. So we're going to start off with prehistory. Once we get the word written on the card, we're going to turn it over to the line side. Because when you're writing your definition, it's nice to have these little lines so that you can uh, write straight across the card instead of, like me, I sometimes end up writing at, at, a, you know, at an angle here. When we look at a definition, uh, any teacher will tell you a good definition consists of four parts. A who or a what, a when, a where, and a why. And so those are the types of things we want to add. Now as we go throughout the year, we'll start putting these in paragraph form, but the important part is going to be to get you to start looking for those four pieces of information. Now sometimes those pieces are going to be easy to find, other times they're going to be a little bit harder. Okay, so let's start off here with the first one, a who or a what. Okay, now they don't have to go in any particular order. I have a tendency to put them all in the same order all the time. But that's just kind of me. I can be a little OCD sometimes. So a who or a what? Now, wow. We can kind of, let's see, Benjamin Franklin. He's a who. Okay? He, he was a scientist. He was an inventor. He was a writer. He was a philosopher. Those things could also fill an aspect of what he was. But really, we know he's a who. He's a person. Okay, so... The who here is going to be related to what he did, okay? The what, well, let's use the Eiffel Tower as an example. It's a what. It's a building. It's a monument. It's a structure. It's not a who, okay? So generally, things that people, okay, they're going to be the who. Things that are not alive, things that are structures, things that you can touch, those... Uh, 
inanimate objects, those are the types of things that are going to be a what. Okay? The second piece of information we want is a where. Okay? Now you'll always have these four parts. You'll always have either a who or a what and you'll always have a where. The where is where did it happen? Now one of the things that I see happen quite frequently actually is we start talking about you know various units throughout the year and well it happened in Europe okay well Europe still is a big place we want to know specifically did it happen in Germany did it happen in France did it happen in Geneva a city and if that's the case we want to know exactly where Geneva Switzerland so it needs to be as specific as possible the third piece of information that we need is a when. It's important to know where in the historical timeline we are going to put this information. Okay, now as a general rule, I'm not going to test John dates. I, I don't teach like that. I think that it's more important that you understand concepts. But sometimes it's easier to get a grasp of things when we can put them in that little historical timeline in our brain so that we can know that A happened before B, which happened before, before C. But I'm never going to have a date that you're going to specifically need to know for the test. So we've got three of our four pieces. The last piece here is going to be the why important. You know, I'm writing this a little large, so hopefully it's a little bit easier for you to see. You don't have to leave the blank line in there. In fact, I'd kind of prefer that you didn't because sometimes this why important may actually be a little lengthy. And I also know that some of you have a tendency to write in font size 32. You may want to kind of scale it down a little bit to a standard font size of 12. Okay, so now we have our four labels here. And, and I will also suggest that you kind of keep your put your labels on the card. It's a lot easier when you're looking at pieces of information, especially as you start out, to know what type of information it is that you're looking for. And if you put the labels, I know it takes a little extra time and a little extra ink out of your pen, uh, but I think it ultimately will kind of help you separate the four pieces of information. The other thing it does is it helps you make sure you have all four pieces of the information. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to take our word, which again is prehistory here, and we want to start working up the definition. Now I'm going to kind of help you with this one. Um, but as we go through, and, and as a general rule, you'll have some time to work on these and get the definitions out of your textbook. Now it's kind of good to remember what our word is here. So I'm just going to kind of write it up here so that we know what it is. Okay, to kind of jog our memory here. So as we look at prehistory, prehistory is not a person, it's more of a time frame. Okay, and so we're going to be answering the what portion of this question. So what is it? Okay, well I'm going to tell you that prehistory is the period of time that we have in our historical timeline before writing was invented. So we don't have a written record that these people have left behind that, that kind of gives us an accurate account of what their life was like. And so without that written record, we ultimately have to look at the things that they left, artifacts, things that they shaped, things that they created to help their survival, and then kind of make our best educated guess of what those things were used for and what their life was truly like. Now we not only have the artifacts that they've left behind, but we have geological information that that they can determine from these time frames kind of what uh, the environment was like, maybe what type of animals there is. It kind of really encompasses not only just the historical aspect, but we're pulling in other aspects of biology and anthropology, geology, uh, anything that kind of helps, you know, paleontology that gives us a, a greater understanding of, of their, their life. So I'm going to start out here with our what, okay, and if you want you can cross out who, and so it's the time before writing, boy I better make sure I spell right here, writing was invented. Okay, so that's a pretty quick and dirty first part of the definition. The second question we need to answer is where. 
Okay, now again, your textbook, this information will be in there for you to be able to get, but I'm also going to tell you that we have found evidence of people in existence on our planet in just about every continent of the world. So we've found evidence of people during this prehistoric time living in America, sorry, Africa, China, Asia, oops, see here I am spelling wrong again, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. So really just about everywhere. Now it's not like they're everywhere all the time. Okay, we'll kind of talk about the migration, uh, but it is uh, firmly believed that most life started in Africa and then kind of uh, migrated out of that area. Okay, so the when. Well, most of the civilization, we're going to talk about the four ancient civilizations as we uh, in our second unit here, but most of the civilizations develop writing right around 3500 BCE. Okay, so this is going to be before BCE. Now, the four major civilizations we're going to talk about, which is going to be Egypt, Middle East, India, and China. Okay, they all kind of develop writing at a different time, but this is kind of a good basic ballpark figure. Sometimes when we do the when, it's not going to be a nice little neat date like July 4th, 1776. Sometimes we're going to have to make our best, closest estimation that we can. Okay. So now we have what it was, where it was, and when it was. And so now we have to look at why is it important. Why it's important is, is going to be probably one of the hardest aspects to come up with because this isn't going to be this isn't going to be a sentence in your textbook. This is something that you're actually going to have to think about. I mean, the textbook, and, and I'm going to give you some clues as to this, but you may have to actually kind of enlist a little bit of brain power to kind of come up with a good why important. Now, your why important as a whole ought to be about three to five sentences. Now, sometimes it's easier to get than others. Sometimes you'll have a whole paragraph that you'll put there because it's just such an important topic. So it's going to vary, but I will be looking for probably about three sentences or so, or at least a good section of text. We'll be honest, on these I'm not going to correct like your punctuation in that, so if it's just a really long sentence, I'm probably okay with that, because for me it's going to be more about content than it is about the structure. Okay, So just kind of thinking about this here for a minute, you know, prehistory. These are the first people that we have that we know existed on our planet. And, and so even though we don't have a record, re, written record from them, they really are, they're our ancestors. We, they're important because they are the foundation to, to modern societies. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that we need to know where we came from to kind of truly understand where we are. And this is going to be important, too, because it's you know, one of the big topics we're going to talk about is technology. And, and so these people had to really apply this thought of technology in, in order just to make it through one day in order to, to survive to the next. So I... Okay, so the next thing we need to think about is the why important. Now, this is the hard part, okay, because this isn't going to be written out in a sentence or two in your textbook. You're going to have to read the section that talks about the word, gives you the definition, or gives you the, that partial definition of it, and then kind of reinforces it with information of the time period. And, and then you have to kind of come back and synthesize all that information and put it together. Okay, and so I'm going to start this out here by why this time period of prehistory is important is because they really are the foundation for us and for society. I mean, really, if it hadn't been for them, we wouldn't be here. I mean, they are our, our, our relatives thousand years removed, but we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. We also wouldn't be here if it hadn't have been them going through this, this process of trial and error, figuring out what you can eat, how you can catch it, how, you know, what's going to help uh, 
heal you. Now, because these people of prehistory didn't leave us any written records, because, again, it's the time period before writing was invented, we rely upon the things that they left behind. Okay, so we use shards of pottery, weapons, tools, buildings, that have been left behind I can talk faster than I can write <laughs> that have been left behind and we use that to make our best guess about what life was like for them Okay, now, and, and this is one of those things is we kind of, over time, okay, these are the things that archaeologists and anthropologists dig up and, and kind of look at in, in their digs that they have, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but these are the little arrowheads, the, the little things that we can look at and say, this does not occur naturally in nature. Someone or something had to modify this, this object's shape to use it for a specific job. And, and that's what we talk about here by um, the, the artifacts really that have been left behind. These things here are important for us, again, because there is no written record. So this is a good start on a definition, again, a four-piece who, what, when, where, and why definition of what we have for prehistory. Okay, now the other thing that we want to do once we have a definition, and this will probably be the last part that we do, and like I said, I'm not going to have you do this for every unit, but what we want to do is we want to create a visual representation for that definition. Okay, so keeping in mind, it's a time before writing was invented, we kind of know where, we know when, and we know what it was and why it was important. So now we kind of have to think, again, for a little bit, about what type of a picture we can draw that is going to accurately represent what these words in the definition tell us. Okay. And some of these pictures will be easier to draw than others. Prehistory, actually, in my mind, is you know, probably a little easier to you know, than some of the others to draw, because again, it is that time before writing was invented. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take and draw a little piece of paper, okay, there's our little piece of paper, okay, and I'm going to write squiggly lines on it, because you're, you know, looking at a paper that has writing on it from far away, that's kind of what it looks like, okay, and then maybe we can come in here and we can draw a, something it kind of looks like a pen, okay, and, and maybe just so that we know that it's a pen, maybe we'll kind of draw a little ink well here, okay. Okay, so maybe my ink well didn't turn out very good. I'm not a very good artist, and you'll have plenty of opportunity to laugh at my pictures all year long, uh, and I'm okay, I'm used to that. Okay, so here we have a piece of paper with writing on it. Okay, but this is before history, before writing was invented. So maybe the easiest way to represent that is just with a big no sign. Nope, they weren't writing because they hadn't figured it out yet. Okay, so now we have our word. We have a picture. Nope, there was no writing. Okay, so that gives us the, the a visual representation of, okay, this was a really, really long time ago. Okay, and so that will help us understand, okay, if, we, if they didn't leave a written record because they didn't yet know how to write, well, then we had to find other ways to figure out what their life was like so that we have this nice little class called World History to teach you. Okay, and so as we go through, the whole purpose of this is to help you in your studying of your vocab terms. And so as you go through, I'm going to strongly suggest, I don't like the word flashcards, but really that's kind of what they are is we want to study them from both sides of the card, okay? And so as you go through, you want to look at all of the cards with the word first in the picture. 
If you can't come up with what the definition is by just looking at the word, look at the picture. See what you've, you've drawn out. Okay, paper, writing, no sign. Okay, there was no writing, so prehistory was that time period that was really long ago. Turn the card over, read the definition, see if you're correct. Okay, and note the places that maybe you didn't remember each of those four pieces. Then, as you get done and you've went through all the words looking at the word first, come back around the other way and just look at the card. Time before writing was invented. It's a foundation for us as humans and society. These are the things that they had created to leave behind, which we were able to find, and then make a determination of what they used them for, so that we can then have our best guess of what their life was like. Okay, no writing was invented, so that had to have been prehistory. Okay, then you can flip it over, see if you were correct. Okay, so that's your first card done. Okay, uh, one of the next cards that we want to go on to is the other one we started here, which is artifact. Okay, you erase that word right there. Okay. okay, artifact. So we have our word. We want to turn the card over. We want to start off. Okay, who and what? So is artifact a who or a what? Okay, it's not a person. Okay, so it's going to be a what? We're going to have a where, we're going to have a when, and again, we're going to have the why important. Okay. What an artifact is, is it's an object that's been shaped by humans. It's, it's the arrowheads, it's the little fish hooks that, that people have taken time to chip out of bone or stone or later on through history in other materials like metals. Okay, but it's something that, again, does not occur naturally. Some theme, someone, had to shape it. Okay, so it's going to be an object left behind that was shaped by humans. Okay. Now, from this standpoint, an artifact doesn't have to be something that's really super old. Okay. Um, if, say, you're sitting at home and you're watching TV and you take the bag of potato chips into the living room to watch TV with and you empty the bag of potato chips, your show's over, you turn the TV off, and you leave the room, but you leave the bag, the empty bag of chips on the table, okay, that's an artifact you left it behind. Okay? Now, it's not something necessarily that you shaped, but it is something that you used. Okay? And so your mom or dad comes home, looks in the living room, and, oh, there's an empty bag of potato chips. Somebody's been eating potato chips in the living room. Okay? And they don't maybe necessarily know who, unless, of course, you're an only child, but it's something that you left behind that, they le that lets somebody else know, hey, somebody was there. Okay. okay, so the next thing we have is where. The where is going to be in the same places that we found evidence of people living during that time of prehistory. Okay, so the same places here are going to be Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Again, not, not all at the same time, but we'll talk about that. But we have found evidence during this time frame before writing was invented of people li living in this time period, or living, sorry, living in these areas. Now, one of the things we want to do when we fill out definitions is, we, again, we always want to make sure that it is specific to the unit we're working on. And that's going to help us keep the definitions consistent for the time period. So... Maybe if artifact, there was something particular about it that we were only talking about artifacts from Africa, then that's the only thing we would put here because it's specific to what we are discussing. And so since we're kind of been talking about the, the whole world at this point in time and that, that migration of humans across the globe, um, then we'll, we'll put these different continents on there.
The time frame here, again, we want to make sure is unit specific. We are in that time period before uh, writing was invented. So we're going to go here and go before 3500 BCE. Okay. Now, why are they important? Okay, now they're important. We kind of talked about it a little bit with prehistory. Uh, pre I mean, tried to, to use the specific things that, that we found as artifacts like pottery, weapons, and tools. Okay, and so we, we may actually want to include that here in our definition. The overall importance is, is that there are things that people have left behind that help us make a guess about what their life was like. Okay, And we have to have something to go on. And since there's no written record, those things are what we have to build that story. Okay, and then again, the more we find information, artifacts in different places, and as, and as those stories start to become complete, we, we do broader our understanding of, of, their, uh, of what they were used for. Other things that it helps us do is as we look at these tools and, and weapons and try to determine what their life was like, it also gives us information information about how they adapted to their environment and their surroundings. Okay. Now one of the things we're going to talk about as we go through this unit especially is there's three things humans need to survive food water and shelter and so as we look at these things like tools we can look at those tools in the the perspective of okay they didn't have houses um, they were generally nomadic in nature to a great extent uh, they didn't stay in one place really for a very long period of time because they ultimately ended up needing to follow their food source. And so they would have to create tools that are going to be able to help them to create some sort of structure to give them temporary, um, temporary cover from any sort of weather event, whether it be heat, rain, snow, uh, those types of things um, to help keep them dry so that it's, you know, a little bit more tolerable to live through these, these extreme weather conditions. But they also are going to have to be hunting. And there may be tools that could, you know, kind of be used not only uh, as, as a weapon to help take down, you know, an, an animal that then they can then prepare to put on the, the, the food for, uh, on the table for food. So there are various things that uh, they're going to be uh, needing to have to chores. They're going to have to get done. They're, they're going to have to create objects that are going to help them complete the task. And, and those objects ultimately are what we're talking about here with the artifacts. Okay, so once we have our definition done, then we need to go back and finish the other side of the card. Okay, and so what we we'll want to do is turn it over. And, and so now what we need to do is, is, now that we have a good definition, and once we have a better understanding of it, now we want to come back and draw a picture that's going to help represent what that definition is. So that if we look at artifacts and we're going, oh, what is it, what is it, what is it? We can look at the picture, and again, it should hopefully give us some of those contextual clues to help jog our memory a little bit so that we can pull that definition out out of uh, our, our memory. Um, and this isn't something I don't want you to feel that the pictures have to be done right now as you do your definitions. It might be easier to kind of get your definitions, the, the who, what, when, where, why aspect of it done, and kind of 
let it simmer a little bit. Think about it for a day or two. And as you, you just start to study your vocab cards and, and as we start going through things in class and things start making a little bit more sense to you, then you can go, oh yeah, I can, I can draw this for my picture. And then you can come back and you can draw your picture and, and that picture will then make sense to you. Okay, so we know that artifacts here are objects that are left behind by humans and they're things that they used and they created and they shaped. Okay, and, and the first one that always kind of comes to my mind, of course, is the arrowhead. Now, again, I'm not an artist, but I do try. Okay, and as we know, an arrowhead kind of, I don't know that, that even, well, let's kind of just start here with a, an an arrowhead and kind of looks like a tip and it's going to be kind of jagged on the edge okay because we know that they weren't smooth it's not going to be till a little bit later that they learn how to make them nice and smooth because they're going to be making these and they have to be chipping stone against stone okay so we have an arrowhead here uh, some of the other artifacts and again we'll learn these as we go through uh, the information for the unit uh, they started to figure out fishing and so we'll have figure out little fish hooks, okay, so that you can attach your line or whatever to it. And so we have a little fish hook here, okay, we'll kind of put a little stream. Uh, other things, uh, they had toys. Now, now toys may be kind of, you know, kind of hard to draw. Um, we, we know that they had pottery, so maybe we can kind of create a, a vase. Okay, over here, or some sort of a, a bowl, okay, that would be used to, to store stuff. We know they put patterns on them, okay. So, kind of disregard that portion there, okay. <laughs> but we have three things here that we can see that are definitely human-made. Okay. They're not things that occur in nature like leaves off of a tree. Okay. They're things that somebody had to take and actually physically create. That's what an artifact is. Okay. So now we have two of our vocab cards, def, uh, cards done. Um, there's one other one that I want to do and then I'll give you a chance to practice with a couple of them. Okay. There's one other term that I want to give you a definition of here. And, and it's because it's a, um, one of those terms that we have a tendency to kind of think of um, about from the standpoint of what it has brought to us, not necessarily about what it is. I remember you know, growing up when we actually had to walk across the room to, to change the channel, and I guess that's why this is kind of funny, uh, is that things have changed. But those changes that we have, this this idea that we have a little thing we can hold in our hand and push a button and it changes the TV channel. It changes the volume for us. Those are things that technology has brought to us. But those gadgets are not technology itself. Okay, so what we want to do is to give you a good definition of technology that we're going to use and it really is going to be the foundation all throughout the, the this course throughout the school year okay so that of course is technology so I'm going to take my card and write technology okay so now we need to do the definition here okay so we're going to come here and we're going to have it's not a who it's a what okay so I'm actually just going to kind of leave the who off because we're getting the right term here and we want to win and we want to wear and we of course want the Y important okay so what technology is it's a change in thinking and practice about how we do something so that we become more efficient like the cartoon that remote control that controls our TV has made changing the channel and raising or lowering the volume of our TV program much more efficient because now we don't ever have to leave our chair we just pick up the remote point it towards the TV and hit the correct button and it'll do what we want it to do okay so I'm gonna write that down here it is a change in thinking and 
practice. Okay, it's something that we actually have to do that creates that gadget. Okay? And kind of imagine that guy who's sitting there, you know, across the, the living room from his TV and, and thinking, wow, wouldn't this be easier if? Wouldn't it be easier to change the channel on that TV if I could just point something to it and push a button? And, and maybe he has the engineering and electrical understanding that he actually can start figuring out, tinkering with ways to make that happen. And wow, all of a sudden we have a remote control. Practice about how we do something. This may actually be a pretty good example of why maybe not to put all of the titles in there because I'm kind of running out of space. Okay, to become more efficient okay. I mean let's face it overall you know we we want to put in at least amount of effort as possible and get the greatest reward. So we always have these people within society that are willing to think about how we can make this job easier. How can we make catching that fish easier so we don't have to spend hours upon hours standing in the river trying to catch these fish with our hands. And so you start tinkering with different ways and ex experimenting and maybe you get really close and it almost works and you keep pushing it and voila, you've invented something that makes it easier to put food on the table. And, and that's kind of one of those things that sets humans apart from other creatures on the planet. We have that ability to kind of logically think through things. And as a result, we create new items that mean that we don't have to put as much effort into some of the things. Now, this is going to be one of those interesting definitions. And I'm going to tell you we're not going to have them very often. Okay, but as we look at the when here, when does technology take place? Well, all the time, really. And we're just, we're not going to have very many definitions that all the time is going to be an acceptable time frame. Now, the next portion also, too, here is going to be very general. Because, again, we look at where did technology take place. Well, again, the reality is, is it took place all over the world. Now, again, there's going to be very few terms that this general of aware is going to be acceptable. Okay? For most of them, for probably 98% of the terms we're going to have all year long, you ought to be able to give me, narrow it down to a very small portion of the map. Okay, so the last portion we need to look at is why important. Okay, now, ultimately, if we look about that, what, what de uh, technology is, it's that change in thinking and how we do something to become more efficient, well, the more efficient we become, the faster we can do things. The, the easier it, it, it becomes, the less effort we have to exert, uh, the more energy we conserve as a result. If we create something that makes it easier for us to put food on the table, then we don't have to spend all day going out and hunting. Maybe we only spend, have to spend a couple hours in the morning. And so if technology has helped us create things that makes it easier to put food on the table, then we don't have to spend as much time gathering that food. Okay, so our why important here is for us as humans to become more productive, more productive with less effort. Okay. Therefore, we save us, or humans, time and energy. Okay. And, and, and that's going to expand. I mean, over time, as we improve through the use of technology, say, manufacturing processes, not only then do we end up saving time and energy, but we could also end up saving money as well and resources. So it really becomes a very large concept. The important thing here is that technology is not those electronic gadgets. It's that process that thinking, that creativity that has allowed us to figure out how to make them. That cell phone helps make us more productive, 
We can make phone calls while we're, you know, riding the bus. And we can make a phone call when we're stuck at school waiting for mom or dad to come pick us up. Hey, where are you? You don't have to walk back into the school to borrow a school phone. You have that availability to you in your pocket, so to speak. Okay, so we're going to come back and I'm going to let you figure out what type of a picture to draw for technology. But again, what we want to do is we want to make sure that it represents that change in thinking. Okay, and, and so we'll kind of let you stew on that one for a little bit. Now, what I want to do is I want to give you a little bit of practice with some terms. Okay, so I want you to take um, these next three words and I want you to start to develop a definition for them. Okay, so the first one here is going to be scribe. And the next one is going to be social classes. And the last one, well, actually we'll have two of them here, okay, is B, C, E, and C. So I guess I've got you four, okay? So I want to give you a few minutes, and I want you to take your vocab cards, start filling them out, who, what, when, where, and why, go through your textbook, pull those three pieces out, and then kind of think about why those are important uh, to create the last portion of your definition. And then we'll come back and we'll, we'll review them. Okay, we want to start off with the, the first word here, strive. Okay, so as you've, you've read through your book and started to come up with your own definition. Now, keep in mind that definitions are um, the exact wording that you use is going to be different than the words I use. And it's okay, because again, what we're looking for is the whole, the, the concept. Okay, it doesn't have to be word for word. And it isn't going to be, because you process information differently than I do, differently than the person who's sitting next to you. Okay, so again, as we look at this, and as you compare yours to mine, we're just trying to get the gist of the idea. Okay, so I start off here with the who, that the scribe is a person who has mastered the writing and reading of the symbols of the written language. Okay, and so very few people are going to do this. In fact, it's usually just the priests. Okay, as, as this starts out realistically um, as a way for the religions to start keeping track of those ceremonies and practices that they are doing in order to keep the gods happy. You've got to, you know, keep track of what you tried, what the end result was. Oh, this didn't work. We, that was really bad. We would better not do that one again. We need to try something different. Okay, so it's going to be very important that these things are done very accurately. It's kind of like spelling. Sometimes it's really important that that word is spelled correctly for people to get the meaning of it. Okay, so the next piece of information that we need is where. Okay, and again, any these four civilizations that we're going to be talking about in, in Egypt and Middle East and India and China, okay, they are all going to develop some sort of written language. And, and so it's these places that we're going to be talking about, not only in this unit, but in the next unit, that over time develop a written language. And they're going to be using these scribes, okay, these people who are trained to do the reading and writing. The when is going to be after 3500 BCE. Okay, now this keeps in line with our definition for prehistory, that time before writing was invented, okay, was about... 3500 BCE. So it's after that period of time that scribes start to be used to keep track of this written language. The why it's important is because it was used to keep track of those religious ceremonies and practices that the priests were doing in order to keep the gods happy. Okay, It's later going to be used by governments as a way to keep track of records, marriages, births, deaths, um, you know, property ownership, uh, business contracts, and those types of things that government can kind of say, oh, well, you have this, this, and this. Well, this is how much your tax is on those things. But as a general rule, the written languages do develop 
out of this need of religions to keep track of what they've tried, what they think worked, what they think didn't work, maybe what they can try again so they don't keep making the same mistakes twice. One of the other aspects of being a scribe is that this skill of, of knowing how to read and write the, the symbols was kept secretive. It, it's it's a job security. If everybody can read and write, then everybody can read the process of the rituals and ceremonies that need to be carried out, when they need to be carried out, exactly how to do them to keep the gods happy. And if everybody can do that, then these scribes ultimately lose their high social status within society. Okay, the next word is social class. Okay, so social classes, as you read in your textbook, basically defines a person's place in society. Okay, and, and uh, with social classes, you know, we, we, of course we still have social classes today. Okay, we have the upper class, the middle class, and the lower class. And, and each one of those classes has kind of different levels within themselves. We have the upper middle class, we have the lower middle class, and just kind of the middle class. Okay, and so at, with that social class, whatever, wherever we fall within that hierarchy, really ultimately defines our place in society. If you uh, are a member of the middle class, then you have opportunities that are going to be available to you that may not be available to someone in a lower social class. You may not have uh, all of the opportunities that are available to you if you were born into the upper class. And so it doesn't mean that, you know, you're stuck there, but it generally we have a tendency to live our life within our own social class. Now, the when, when did we have social classes? Well, we really have them now. We've had them for a long time, but they don't start to de uh, really develop until we, civilization starts. And we look at civilization from that standpoint of a large, a very large group of people settling down, trying to live together in the same place, hopefully for the good of the group. Okay, but it, Generally, what ends up happening is we start to see an evolution of people take on specific aspects within that society. I'm going to be the leader, or I'm willing to be the leader, and other people are willing to be the followers, and let other people make the decisions that, uh, that affect the civilization. And, and then you have you know, people who start to take on various different jobs. And people start to look at, whoa, well, I'm better than you because... I'm the government leader and you're just a follower. And, and that's kind of where we also kind of start to see to a great extent that equality starts to erode away. People are no longer just equal. And, and as we start to see that happen, that's when we develop social classes. And, and the higher you are on the social pyramid, the more power and influence you are perceived to have. The lower you are, the less power and influence. Where do social classes happen? Well, they happen all over the world. Now, again, this will be one of the few where this general of aware will be acceptable. Okay, so why are social classes important? Kind of mentioned a little bit before. I'll just uh, open this up here. But it determines the possibility that you're going to have in your life. Okay, if you are born in a social class where you, you know, a, a very low social class where you have no money, it may be really hard for you to put yourself in a situation where you have the ability to go to college, to get a college degree, to move into a profession where you can better your social class. And, you know, we really have very few people in our society that, you know, are these kind of average Joes, and then all of a sudden are able to propel themselves into the upper class. You know, the, the Bill Gates, the, the Steve Jobs, the, the people who have taken an idea and have been able to, you know, realistically ride it to the moon and now are billionaires because of this one idea that they created and took it as far as it could go and, well, are still really, you know, continuing to push the possibilities forward. But most of us, we have a tendency to 
uh, socialize with people within our own social class because we socialize with them. Those are our friends. Those are the people that we fall in love with and get married to and start families with and generally choose professions that, you know, are with, you know, that people within our social class have. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't make life a little bit better for ourselves. Maybe we are exceedingly motivated. Maybe we work towards getting a scholarship so that we can go to college and we can become that doctor and we can raise our social status a little bit. But very few of us really are those, you know, those Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs. So we talk about the time frame that we're uh, going over in this unit with the beginnings of civilization. Overall, there really was no movement between social classes. There wasn't any opportunities. You didn't associate with anyone outside your class, your social class. You didn't have the opportunity to do that. You were always busy making sure that you were meeting those three things we need to survive, food, water, and shelter, and making sure that you were making your ends meet and, and upholding your responsibilities. We didn't have a lot of opportunities. Kids generally took over your parents' profession. If your father was a blacksmith, and you were a, a male child, you would be out helping him in his shop from the time that you could walk and, and hold a tool. And he'd say, go get a hammer, and you'd scurry over and get the hammer and bring it back to him. And as you got older, you'd start to take on more responsibilities. You'd start learning the skill. And by the time you were a teenager, you could be a master blacksmith, and there was no reason to go get another profession. There just wasn't the opportunity to kind of, like there is today, to really become anything you wanted to be. Your options were limited. Okay, so the last two that we looked at is B, C, E. Okay, now this one is going to be, again, one of those little unique ones, and, and we really won't have very many of these types that don't, really need all four pieces, um, but but this is, is one of them, so it's kind of good that we go over it uh, together as a group, okay? So BCE, again, it's not a person, it's a what, so we have the what here. It stands for Before Common Era, okay? Now, many of you are probably familiar with the more uh, well-known terms that we use as far as for B.C. and A.D., okay? Now, those are shorthand for Latin terms that roughly translate to before Christ and after his death, okay? And so over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, people try to be a little bit more politically correct. And so when you do that, you try to make things more general and remove aspects of um, topics that would maybe be offensive to some. Okay. And so as uh, historians and the social sciences have started to try and be a little bit more politically correct, uh, they've made a, a movement away from these older uh, references to time to remove the aspect of religion. Because um, to be sensitive to all religions, um, not all religions believe in Christ. And so it would be offensive to them that we would use this way to denote time uh, in something that they don't believe in. So we've kind of went to a little bit more of a generic, uh, politically correct term of looking at BCE, before common era. Okay? And uh, we'll, we'll get to the next one, which is common era, okay? which we happen to live in now. Okay? So before common era, when that was, is it was the years before zero. Okay? And uh, there's not really a where, okay? It's everywhere, and so it seems a little bit redundant to kind of write that in. I'm just going to kind of jump straight to the why important. The why, why important here is that it's a reference for years before zero, where they the number started a really high number, okay, like 3500 BCE. That's that's a long time ago. I mean, it's before zero, so it's 3,500 years before zero, and we're at the year, you know, 20 and 13 right now. So that's, boy, that's 5,500 plus years back. I mean, that's kind of a large amount of time to kind of wrap our brain around. 
but the years start very high. We subtract one until we get down to zero, which is that time frame that puts us into the current era, which is where we're at now. Okay, but ultimately it's used to mark the passage of time so that as we talk about these things that happened a long time ago, we can put them in that historical timeline in our brain and kind of start to make sense. That way we can kind of keep things straight of what items happened before others. Okay, now the next term that we have is of course the other term. I'll just erase my little b here and that it is the common era. Okay, and so that's the era that we live in now. And so when is that? It's the current time frame or years that are after zero. Why this is important is going to be very similar to BCE. I mean, it's important for the same thing. It's a reference for years after zero where years start at zero and then go up by one every year after that up until 2013, which we are in now. So it is used to mark the passage of time. Okay, and so it's this way to kind of put the historical events into a consistent timeline, marking time at a consistent pace so that we can keep things in a, in a steady flow and understand the sequence of them. Okay, so we've given you a good head start on your vocab and kind of stepped you through and I, I hope this has been helpful for you to kind of get uh, an understanding of and, and the practice in looking for those four pieces of information that we're going to be looking for as a general rule uh, with our definitions. Okay, and again, everybody's wording is going to be a little bit different. Okay, so one of the big things we have to keep in mind when we deal with vocab is what we're looking for. We are always have a who or a what. Okay, and Again, that has to relate or needs to relate to the word that's on the other side of the card. We're always going to be looking for a when. Okay, and on this, we want to be as specific as possible. We want to narrow that time frame down. We, we don't want it to be very vague. We want to, you know, we want to get it as close as we can. Had a couple words that we've talked about today that are very general, you know, as in all the time, but we're not going to have very many of those. In fact, most of those will be in this unit. The where, again, we want to be very specific because it's helpful to know that. We don't just want to know that something happened in France, especially when we know it really happened in Paris. What it does is it cuts out a very large geographical region that it could have been in. And the last thing we're going to be looking for, of course, is the why important. Now, the why important is probably the hardest one. Because again, it's not going to be just right there in the textbook in a sentence. Okay, we're going to have to think about this information that's up here and kind of say, okay, why is it important? Why do I need to know it? Why is, number one, it important enough to be in my textbook? And why is my teacher talking about it? And, and this is one of those things that takes a little time and a little practice. Okay, so as we go through the year, you are going to get better about it. Okay, and one of the things you can always do is if you've thought about it, you've thought about it, you know, bounce it off of somebody, bounce it off of one of your classmates, talk to your parents, come talk to me, and, and we can kind of help clarify that. I will really try and cover the information of the why important as we go through the unit. But again, it is one of those things that you're going to have to put your little thinking cap on to kind of come up with a, a good statement that says, this is why I need to know this topic. This is why I need to know this definition. Overall, I hope this was uh, helpful for you. Again, we're going to have a, a, some additional time here in class because I want you to start working on them. Please do not hesitate to ask questions. Uh, but it's all to help you start to understand that definitions, good ones, have these four pieces of information. And that's not just for history. It's for math. It's for science. It's for English. It, it's for your computer technology class. All good definitions. And, and these are the types of definitions that college professors will be looking for when they ask you to define a word on a test. Who, what, when, where, why. And uh, you will always have four of those five W's. Okay, so now the time is yours is to start working on your vocab and uh, 
good luck.